Welcome to the first edition of the Spy Report. My name is Dave Whelan and I'm the publisher of the Talbot Spy. And this program is in collaboration with the Avalon Foundation's MCTV. We hope to share five or six different stories with you. And we will be starting with the first one shortly. One of the things that the Talbot Spy prides itself on is trying to find the nooks and crannies in Talbot County and some of the special people who live there. Our next interview is one of those special people. Utrika Lindner has been working with yarn and these fabulous looms in Royal Oak for the last 20 years, but she has been an artist for over 60 years. We checked in with her at Royal Oak uh, a few weeks ago. My accent comes from Sweden. You know, I, I moved to United States in the 1980 and then never moved back to Sweden. I started at 13. And how it started out was that uh, my mother, my adopted mother, um, she used to weave, you know, regular weaving. And wherever you go to schools, the libraries, to churches, there was always a tapestry or something some kind of fiber. No, that's not as, as it is, an art form. I, I wasn't very traditional. And right then, when I, at that age, when I got into it, to the contemporary tapestry has taken off. I don't remember 50s or 60s, when there were a group of artists that introduced the contemporary tapestry in Sweden, and it, it took off like crazy. So when you, you went to art school, you, of course the first thing you were introduced to was not the old ones. You had to learn the old techniques. But in design, you certainly had to learn to be a little bit more modern. To be very honest, what I am thriving for is nothing political, not environmental. I want my tapestry to be beautiful, that people are so excited that they have to have them in their life. This is woven from down here, and if you look at all those shades in my watercolor design here, you can see how complex it is. I mean, you have to change the colors and mix the colors over and over again, and that takes a long time. If you look at my yarn, for example, it's not just one green, it's two, three, or four to obtain a certain shade of green. Yeah. Does that make sense? The worst thing that can happen when you sit and weave this is that you, you maybe, I wove this here yesterday, just an example, and then I'm coming in in the morning to continue, and I realize that this, this green here, for example, this is just an example. This green here is totally wrong. It doesn't work. So then you have to go backwards. And you can't just cut it. You have to unleash each stitch that you wove in. So you, when you do this, you have to really step back and look at your work and make sure that you don't pick the wrong tone of color. That's what I said earlier. You know, it's almost like meditation. You get into a stage of quietness. I can't have music going. Anything that is disturbing stops me in the track. What do I think about? I think I think more ahead of what I'm going to do when I get up here so I am prepared in my weave. I, oh, I don't think about anything else. I don't think about what I'm going to cook for dinner tonight because then I, if I do that I have to leave. I get tired. I mean I think mentally you get tired. Yeah. Because it, it's, it, it's a, you're engineering all the time, because you're thinking forward. It's not just what colors, it's also how you technically is, are going to resolve that particular shape in the design. Yeah. So it's not just sitting weaving like this, it, it, it's a lot of thinking behind it. Like weaving, it's, it's very difficult to sell a tapestry. Is that what you mean? Yeah. It's very expensive. Yeah. If you look at the time involved in a tapestry, you learn that today you realize it's not going to be 5,000. Yeah. It's a big investment. And that keeps the big uh, mural-sized tapestries down because of the cost. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course you could go in and make pot holders but, and sell a lot, but that's then the whole idea about a real tapestry will disappear. Yeah. Yeah. So we that are still doing it need to keep it going. Our next report is a remarkable interview the spy did with Walter Black, Jr. 
Many in the community will recognize Walter Black's name since he has been the former president of the NAACP as well as being a political activist since the early 1960s. We thought it would be a good time to check in with Walter on how he believes the civil rights movement has changed in America, his thoughts about the current administration, and his ideas about the future for the civil rights movement going into the 21st century. I was born in Salisbury, Maryland. I moved to Talbot County when I was 20 months old. Oh, okay, so you're a newcomer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I graduated from high school and then I went away to Morgan State College, which is now Morgan State University. Then from there, I went to law school. From there, I went to the military. Um, and um, I settled in Washington, D.C. When I came back home for good, it was 10 years ago and it means I had been gone for a total of like 52 years before I came back for good. Now I used to come back and forth and, and quite frankly, I was at home so, so often until a lot of people never, thought I never left. It can adequately be said that I had dual residency because the time that I was in Washington, D.C., I was also the president of the NACP here in Tarleton County for a while and I was also president of the Maryland State NACP. Oh, is that so all my activity, uh, act, uh, in terms of organizations and so forth, was in the state of Maryland. Two things about Cambridge, at least in terms of the big civil rights episodes. First in 1963, that's when the National Guard went down. And I missed all that good action because I was stationed in Fort Worth. I was way out in Fort Worth, California. I almost went AWOL, went and come home with Jordan. But that was in 1963. We had National Guard down there for maybe a couple months. And then in 1967, that's when Rap Brown came to town and some buildings burned down. Okay. Wasn't really a riot, you know, it was played up as a riot. But what happened was, um, on the last day of school of 1967, um, a little black student, elementary, first or second grade, was walking home from school. Two little white boys, again, first or second grade, they're about sick, their dog on him. Now, they didn't get hurt, they really didn't get hurt, but Apparently, the, um, the, the black student went home, told his mom, so forth, and um, then uh, she reported it to the law enforcement. So the, the uh, little, uh, two little white boys were, um, were charged, and they went to court. Mrs. Juanita Mitchell, who at that time, who, who, by the way, was a great, tremendous civil rights attorney and uh, just uh, a civil rights uh, activist. Uh, she didn't back down, she didn't take any prisoners, she, she um, won a lot of civil rights cases um, for the NACP, but she was the president of the NACP at that time. Anyway, she called me and said, Walter, let's go, go down and observe the trial. So we went down and observed the trial, and on the strength of the testimony of a white store owner, um, those two little white boys were convicted. Well, the judge didn't send them to jail, and there's no reason to send those two kids. It was just a kid, a prank. That's all it was. And he didn't send them to jail. Well, some in the black community, some of the black activists at that time, they raised hell. Oh, they really had. And we had a few mass meetings down there and so forth. So someone called Gloria Richardson back, and she came back to Cambridge. And Gloria was involved with a Student Nonviolent Action Committee, SNCC, right, because the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee is the organization that she was the chairperson of uh, going back to 1963. And um, so that was an affiliate of SNCC. So by that time, Rap Brown, you know, John Lewis used to be the chairperson of, of, of SNCC. Well, by that time, Rap Brown was the chairperson. So uh, apparently, she um, got in contact with Rap Brown to come down and have a rally. Had the rally there on Pine Street. Now, while the rally was going on, right across the street from uh, where the um, Elks home is now, there was a two-story black wood frame elementary school. 
and somebody set the school on fire while Rap Brown was having, and of course, all his words were inflammatory, you know. If, if, if Cambridge doesn't turn it down, uh, turn it around, we'll burn it down, all that stuff, you know. And uh, so, um, uh, the fire from the school spread. That's, that's how that fire started. Uh, and now I had seen uh, where uh, several days prior to Rap Brown coming to town, where the school had been a set of fire before, but it went out. Flame went out, so they did it again. And of course it burned it down. Arson, right? Let me put it this way. The information that I have came to me, suggested that it was intentionally set on fire. Yes. And um, so there, was, there were uh, several black businesses that were burned down. Uh, the Elks Home, a place called um, Green Savoy and a couple other places. And um, then <laughs> um, what's interesting is a uh, little piece of um, trivia is, well, how did Rap Brown get out of town? Okay. He went to the hospital because somebody shot a shotgun um, and one of those pellets hit him. Well, it was a, it was a um, strategy in the civil rights movement at that time that the least little uh, uh, situation that happened in terms of an injury or, or, or superficial inju injury or something like that, go to the hospital so we can build our case. See? Saying that the uh, law enforcement or the power structure uh, um, was abusive and uh, uh, so forth. So while Rap Brown was at the hospital in Cambridge, word came down to the black community that uh, Yates was going to, the state's attorney was going to charge him with inciting a riot. So they had to get Rap Brown out of town. Took him out in the hearse. Now, the St. Clair Funeral Home was the headquarters for uh, the civil rights activities back in 1963. And um, so um, they put him in the hearse and they took him through East New Market. And a friend of Rat Brown, who was probably another SNCC worker, came down from Washington, D.C. and picked him up. I uh, was not a proponent of violence. And I have never uh, embraced that. But in terms of direct action, uh, certainly I'm a proponent of that. I mean, I led some demonstrations uh, in various places uh, in uh, the state of Maryland, including here in Talbot County. And I'm ready to leave another one, to tell you the truth. Um, I need to exercise in my old age. Well, in 1961, uh, you understand, and you were well aware that the Civil Rights Act of 64 had not passed. So that was legal segregation, see. Um, I, I, I couldn't, the only place in town that would let black folks sit down and eat with Tower Water Inn and, and, and um, Hill's uh, drugstore up here. Is that right? That's right. Those were the only two places you could go to the Tower Water Inn. Well, Mr. Grimes, Johnson Grimes, who owned the Tower Water Inn, he was from Staten Island, New York. So he didn't come down with all this baggage, and plus he had a whole lot of money. In fact, in 1959, the Frontiersman was a black organization, um, had um, uh, uh, its, um, during the Christmas holidays, it had um, um, a formal affair mm -hmm. and um, um, in the gold room. So some of the um, homies, uh, the white folk business people around town didn't like it and they uh, I was told that they went over to say something to Mr. Grimes, and he said, told them they could go to hell. He was a millionaire, he, I mean, he did. and then Hill's Drugstore, you know, in those days, and it still is, Hill's Drugstore is probably one of the few drugstores that still has a lunch counter. Yeah. So, yeah, black folks could go in there and issue. The issue was to, to break down um, uh, segregation. Now, um, in schools, lunch counters, employment, housing, across the board. Those were the legal issues. Now, it was easy to focus on um, legal segregation by go, uh, states and sit-ins at the lunch counters. Did you feel like it was a hostile environment in Talbot County? And you to be quite honest about it, I never fo 
thought that there was a hostile environment, but there was an environment of indifference and, it, uh, and it, uh, an environment of legalized segregation and discrimination. Yes. And I um, realized that when I was probably five, six years old. See, um, I realized that was a difference. I always look at it this way. Um, there's segregation and there's discrimination. And the two are not necessarily the same. See, segregation is not giving me that job. Discrimination is I'm on that job and then you don't promote me. You get promoted, but I don't get promoted. Uh -huh. See? Um, so segregation is still around. Yeah. I mean, uh, discrimination is still around, even places that have been uh, desegregated. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's what I uh, look for now. And I, as, as uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said, um, uh, freedom is never given up by the uh, oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. We move on with a wonderful interview with a local retired attorney and now fiction writer, Ron Liebman. Ron, who worked at the prestigious law firm of Patton Boggs for most of his professional career, as well as a lead prosecutor in the trials of Spiro Agnew and Marvin Mendel, has now decided that he wants to return his attention to the writing of books. His next book, which will be out next week, deals with the idea of big firms. These are large legal firms that are not only uh, with thousands of employees, but in locations throughout the world. He saw that as a good stage for his next novel, and we caught up with him at Bullet House last week. Uh, Big Law is um, just that. It's a, a story about life in one of America's uh, fictitious but uh, largest and most prestigious law firms. Uh, the business world grew by leaps and bounds. Uh, businesses became gigantic, multinational. Uh, the banks and their derivative trading and, and uh, private equity and so as a consequence, these law firms became, took a page out of the book, in essence, of the corporate world that was their client base, that is their client base, and they grew along with them so that these firms are now uh, located in, in more than one city, uh, many of them in, many, in most of the major cities in the U.S. and abroad. And I was a part of big law uh, in my time in private practice, and I... Um, I'm a watcher, you know. I, as I mentioned earlier, in addition to doing my work, I sort of mentally record, uh, I can't help myself, uh, people and cases and, and things like that. And I thought it would be uh, interesting to write a story about what life is like inside one of these law firms. Uh, and so the main character is a, a young partner who, uh, as I like to say, was not to the manor born. Uh, he lives in New York. He's a first-generation Irish-American. He's got a dad who is a doorman in a uh, posh Upper East Side uh, apartment building who's also a drunk and mean-spirited. Um, he went to uh, state law school, and uh, he made it. He made partner against all odds. And the chairman of the firm, who is uh, a very complicated, uh, devious, brilliant person, gives this uh, young lawyer, whose name is Carney Blake, what Carney thinks is the case of a lifetime, a case that a young partner would not get without more senior supervision. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's that case that uh, turns uh, the story uh, into a, a plot line. And um, the book starts with um, Carney uh, and his ne'er-do-well brother. He has a brother who um, is very much a blue-collar guy, in trouble with the law. And they're sitting in a bar, 
in the Hell's Kitchen area of New York where he grew up, which back then was a very rough area, but by the time the book, uh, the story takes place, has become gentrified. But he's sitting in the bar midday, and they're waiting on a jury. And um, Carney, in first-person narrative, says to the reader, you're thinking I'm sitting here drinking during the day while my client is off somewhere biting his nails, worrying about whether he'll be convicted or not. Well, guess what? I'm the client. I'm the one waiting for a jury. And then we, we begin the book by going back in time. Well, well the, culture of, the culture of law firms has most definitely uh, uh, changed. You know, uh, when I was a young lawyer, um, law, law was more of a calling. Uh, it was mostly male at the time. I, there, were only, there was only one woman in my law school class, so it was kind of a fraternity. Uh, yeah, there was billing of clients and a business aspect to it, but law was a calling, a profession. Um, that certainly in the world of big law has changed uh, enormously. Big law is a big business. Uh, there's a lot of pressure. You know, there was a time when uh, a lawyer graduated from law school. Uh, he may have worked for the government for a while or, or she went right into a law firm and that's where that lawyer would stay for his or her entire career. Uh, once you were there, you were there and you were happy to be there, uh, as hard and difficult as the work was. But as, uh, as the law firms grew and became such uh, uh, powerful and um, uh, uh, important uh, aspects of our society, uh, they changed. And there's a lot of movement uh, that, you know, lawyers don't stay. They, they, uh, they leave when they get better authors. They take their clients with them. They take their colleagues with them. And the, the older lawyers in the profession bemoan that. Uh, um, I, think, I think the younger lawyers have just sort of grown up with that. I very much enjoyed my, my career as a lawyer, and I do respect the law. Um, and I have, I have great faith in juries. You know, as a litigator, I've tried a lot of cases. And more often than not, sometimes despite the mystique of what goes on in a, in a courtroom and the complications of the evidence, the jury more often than not gets it right. And judges more often than not get it right. I mean, there are some judges who are characters, there are some judges who are mean-spirited, there are some judges who are brilliant, and some who are mm, not playing with a full intellectual deck, uh, which makes for great fiction. But by and large, it works. Uh, it, it does work. The next program we have is a great story about what's taking place in the Episcopal Church. They've selected a new bishop, and we sat down with Bishop Mari just last December at the Trinity Cathedral to talk about his faith, his love of God, and the future of the Episcopal Church. A little bit about me, of course. Um, I'm not from here. I'm a, what they say, come here. Uh, that's the designation, the use of people like myself who would come from another place. Um, but I come here from being a global Christian. Well, that, what I mean by that is that I have okay. served the church all over the world. Um, from South America, my homeland is Guyana, to the Caribbean, to Seychelles, to the the Global Anglican Communion and now to the U.S. So I have seen the church in its many variations and iterations. And, and I say this because when I started out ministry in my home country, Guyana, I mean, it was, for me, a remarkable thing. I thought I could change the world. Then I realized soon after then that the world <laughs> is far more than I could ever imagine. And I'm just a speck. My job was to not seek to change the world, but my job was to collaborate with others so that together we change the world. Yeah, yeah. So it's a more of an objective thing rather than a subjective thing. It's more, it's less ego-centered and more community-initiated, yeah. and therefore to live in community 
and to serve in community is a remarkable gift from God. Yeah. And Jesus teaches that model when he gathers his disciples to show us that this thing is best effectively done through the process of collaboration yeah. and working yeah. together. Yeah. So what I'm saying, that what I mean by that, even though God is way ahead of me, God wait is, waits for me to catch up. So within the confine of what I'm able to conceptualize and, and be inspired by what God is leading me to, God uses my current experience and exposure to effect whatever blessings through me God wants to do. Eastern Shore is way different to Alabama, where I come from. I was going to ask about that. Way different to East Carolina, where I was before I went to Alabama. Way different to the Seychelles in the Indian Ocean, where I was first called to be bishop. And even way different to Africa, where I've served, and in Madagascar, and all these other places. It's a remarkable sight to see the church functioning in this area. So what I have learned to do, and I've learned this not by my own wisdom, but by my own mistakes that wised me up, that the local context is an important vehicle for education of the person. And so what I'm doing now is I'm going around the diocese on a 100-day pilgrimage where I'm going to every community in our diocese where we have a congregation, hearing from the, the membership, hearing from God's people, and listening to their stories, and they listen to my story. And I'm, what I'm getting there, in, in a way, besides getting to know the people God has called me to serve, and to understand their context, and to show them that I love them, and I'm here to serve them faithfully, is I'm getting to learn some of the important intricacies of local context living. Is that I want to see the people of God in the Diocese of Easton grow more in their faith and grow more in their knowledge of God. One of the remarkable tragedies of the Episcopal Church, and it's, it's a self-confessed opinion by several others, is that Episcopalians have great difficulty evangelizing. And what I mean by that is this. They have some remarkable stories about faith, but they're ashamed to tell it. Or not ashamed, but they feel intimidated to tell it. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have come to realize that they don't have the vocabulary to tell it. The lexicon is missing, even though the faith is strong. Mm -hmm. One of my foremost tasks here is to help Episcopalians tell their faith stories how God has worked in their lives and what has brought them to this faith and what has sustained their faith so that when they go out into the public square they are able to articulate their faith in a way that is compelling and a way that is attractive and in a way that will even help them to move to the next level of their own faith formation mm -hmm. yeah, very cool. and, and therefore at the same time bring others in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's what, what one of my uh, great, um, if I should say, desires is to do that. Also, did it work well? Did you do that in Alabama? Was that part of Oh, the, yes. Oh, yeah, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, we have done that. We, we have begun an evangelism program there um, that I've left. It yeah. was in the beginning stages of it. Mm -hmm. um, where as I did say what well, where we have begun with having group discussions yeah. um, where we have begun by having dinners in people's homes where um, members will invite the other members for dinner over a meal and they're gonna they're learning to tell their faith story yeah. in a way I see that they're sharpening up the skills within people of their own yeah. um, likes and people of their own um, friendship and fellowship so it's 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 nice to practice it in a comfortable setting before you kind of go out into a less comfortable setting. Well, I've always believed that, you know, the church lives in the tension of the day. I've always said to people that as a bishop, I recognize my role as living in tension. Um, to hold up both sides of the aisle in a loving, caring manner. 
but not ever forgetting that the role of the church is to be the reconciling agent of God in this world. God's instrument of reconciliation is the church. And uh, so despite where one may sit in the political preference, mm -hmm. the church should never ever forget that our role is to be the, the bomb, the healing bomb, the reconciling agent. I say to to the places I've gone to and preachers said, we are reconciled reconcilers. That's how I define my life and, and I ask them to define it. What I mean by that, God has reconciled us to himself so that we can reconcile others to each other. And we had um, the election. We had we had a clergy clericus here um, at the cathedral, which we do once a, a month. And I said to the clergy, I want you to remember, and that was, that was on December the 8th, um, November the 8th, sorry, uh, that our work begins tomorrow. Nobody was listening to us yesterday and the next day and the next day because they were all caught up in party politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow, meaning the night, would be our time to be the church again mm -hmm. because the division is so great that people would look to their church for healing and for reconciliation. And maybe a way forward? And a way forward. And helping each other to live in unity despite their diversity. Yeah. Diversity is not uniformity. You know, diversity allows for different opinions. But the, the, the gift of the church in all of this is how do we pull, how do we teach our people to pull the strands of all of this diversity into a wholesome way that even though we may have different viewpoints, yet we are able to collaborate, to love, to live, to do good deeds of faith, to go to habitat and build homes for the underprivileged. Okay. That our, our political preferences, they dwarf when it comes to respond to social needs yeah. and the lives of people. Yeah. And that is where the church is most effective, teaching people to use their diversity for the good of humanity. Another exciting thing that happened with the SPY last month is we started our Senior Nation section. As the name probably indicates, we focus on senior issues in Talbot County, but across the mid-shore. And one of the great challenges in senior life is when older parents of adult children get to the point where they can't maintain independent living, or what they call aging in place. Eric Holtz was one of those people, and he and his mother decided that they wanted to check out Dixon House, which has turned out to be a great success story for them. We talked to both of them at Dixon House about this decision last month. Actually, Mom was here first. I was here first. Yeah, yeah we had a yeah. we had a weekend home in Rock Hall for many many years. Oh, I yeah. And we would go there on weekends and in the summer, and then Mom had a gentleman friend that had a uh, waterfront farm outside of Cambridge, out uh, on uh, Castlehaven. Castlehaven, yeah. So, and then when mom decided to retire from uh, her business in Baltimore, she moved to Cambridge. Yeah, I moved to Cambridge. At oh, a no. point in time, she decided the house in Cambridge was an old, big, Victorian, beautiful home, and mom kept it in perfect condition, but it just got to be too much, and she decided to sell that, and she moved here into town in Easton because I had moved to Talbot County myself, Mm -hmm. in 1990 and I had moved into town in 1996. So shortly thereafter mom moved to Easton and we wound up here in Easton together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Separate houses. Separate. I love Easton. Oh I do too. Easton yeah. is my home. Yeah. I lived in Baltimore my whole life until I moved here but I really feel as though Easton is my home. Yeah. At this point I feel more connected here than I ever did really in Baltimore as far as a connection yeah. to the 
to the ground and the community, and I love it here. I'm not sure I really remember exactly how, you found how I found it. I know, you know, as uh, mom was living on her own very independently and, and such, and, you know, we, we started getting to the point where, you know, she wasn't preparing meals as often and needed a, a little bit of help and, and that sort of thing. And um, we started thinking about you know, alternatives, and uh, I started asking around a little bit, and the, the, the Dixon House kept coming up as, yeah. as far as a, a possibility. Yeah. Um, Mom was reluctant to, to leave her home. She'd been very independent for very many years, and uh, so, um, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, the situations changed, and we needed to make a decision, and Mom came over and for a visit and got her hair got done and got a pedicure <laughs> and, a good and, um, and a spa. decided to uh, decide to stay. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when you really look around here as far as the physical structure and the Victorian atmosphere and the porch across the front, uh, it's this is only 18 rooms. It's really like a little Victorian boutique hotel. Yeah. I like it. Mom loves the porch. Yeah. Yeah, I'm crazy about the porch. Do you have a favorite chair? Hmm? Do you have a favorite chair? Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, get a little annoyed <laughs> when people are in it. <laughs> yeah, get out of my <laughs> chair. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> where Mom's room is on the second floor, there's a screen porch right on the corner, right next to her room. Yeah. And her favorite wicker chair from her porch at home we brought over here and is on that porch. So if she decides to go on that smaller porch upstairs, mm -hmm. she's got her wicker chair that she's had for decades. Oh, yeah. right. But she really does prefer to be on the main front porch on the rockers with all the rest of the residents. Yeah. I have been in this building variously at every hour of the day and night and everything is always just right. Yeah. Just like you want it to be. Yeah. And you know, mom is happy and and uh, uh, and safe, yeah. and it really is an enormous um, comfort to me knowing yeah. that she's here. I don't really have much of a, what you would call a routine. I I think I just kind of let it carry out on its own. I get up when I get up, and that's it. Generally, around the crack of noon. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, not Mom's not a morning person. Oh, okay. It's not uncommon, I think, for the staff to find her in the living room watching television at midnight. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. Jim. I wish that everyone could have this kind of a retirement experience. And unfortunately, I don't think there are very many places like this. No, like the I Nixon don't think House. there are. Yeah. Um, I think this is the exception. Yeah. And I would love to think that there would be places like this all over, and I don't know that I've found one, yeah. at least yeah, certainly not locally here other than uh, the Dixon House. Well, thank you for watching the first edition of The Spy Report. I hope you'll come back next time. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.